yeah, hi everybody. Welcome back after lunch. Glad you stayed with me. Um, I, my name is Hans Christian Fessel. I work for the Viennese Concert House, which is a cultural institution in the heart of Vienna. We play a lot of classical music, but we also try to put a lot of jazz and pop and world music into our schedule. Uh, we have four rooms. Uh, it's very cool. So if you're in Vienna, check it out. It's a really cool program. Yeah, so uh, a big applause to Viennese uh, Concert House yeah. and Hans. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I also do a couple of other things. Uh, I'm also a freelancer for design, development and consulting, uh, where I help smaller agencies to just get their things done that they uh, told their clients that they would do. And I'm also a lecturer at the SRE Institute in, the, uh, in Vienna, where I uh, teach students about usability, usability testing, human-computer interaction, and prototypes by asking you three questions. First is, whose dedicated job is it to actually create user interfaces or user experience? Two, three, okay, good. Um, who ha actually has to create, not on a regular basis, but every now and then, a user interface or user experience? Much more, surprise. And then the last question is, who actually likes to do, to create user interfaces? I hope all the people whose dedicated job is it also raise their hands, because otherwise I would rethink that. But. <laughs> Other than that, uh, a lot of you have to create user interfaces, even you, you might don't like it, you didn't do a lot of research on it, you just do it because it's part of your job, because otherwise nobody would do it. So the thing with that is that as a developer, you are no longer a normal user, because as a developer, you know what's going on behind the show that we user interface designers put on, or you as a user interface designer put on, that is called a user interface, where we hide problems that m might be in the logic, or even translate logic from the business logic that is in the back end to what the processes look like for the users. So users don't understand this translation they really don't. And the thing is, they also don't have to because it's not their job. Their job, they have other jobs. They need to sell stuff, they need to sell, um, they need to make the booking, they need to do lots and lots of jobs. And the last thing that they want to think about is how their computer works. They want to turn it on in the morning, get their coffee, and turn on the three to five to six, maybe even eight systems. They actually know how to run. So let's give them just that. Give them a thing that works for them, not for us, not for us developers. Because remember, it's called a user interface, not a developer interface. We have our debuggers, we have our logs, we have all these things we understand that help us to understand the system, communicate with the system. But users don't have that. They have only the things that we show them. We have, they only see what we put in front of them. So let's talk about the agenda and how we might improve this experience for the users. First one, we will talk about why it's in your interest, you as a developer, to create a better user experience, a better user interface for your users. Second, there will be three things I teach you that will help you with that. I know that sounds a bit clickbaity and a bit like, ooh, these things that, three things in your morning routine that will improve your day, but it's actually only three things and I swear by them. And the third thing is, um, how to think like a user. Because as I just said, as a sub-developer, you no longer can think like a user because you understand what's going on behind. So when I talk to developers, a lot of them start by, why? 
oh, why do I think like a, you need to think like a user? I, I don't need to understand the system. I don't care about the user. But you need to create this interface. You need to be a translator between the computer and the user. The interface between human and computer interaction. When you want to design a good user interface, everybody can design a user interface, but the thing that turns it is whether it's a good one or not. So, well, why? First, it will help you with the users. They will be nicer to you, more forgiving. We fuck things up. That's not, a, that's not a secret. We sometimes do stuff and it's not good for the users, it's not good for the business. But if the users actually think that we care about them and that we like to interact with them, they will be nicer to us, more forgiving. When we fuck things up or when we even might did something that was against them. It's kind of a reputation thing, a thing where it's just in German, we have this nice saying of how you call into the woods, so we'll come back. Um, and I think this is very much that. Be nice to your users, listen to them, and don't everything they say, just be like, meh. Just talk to them, be nice to them. Second thing is, have a dialogue with them. Don't let them shout at you and then you shout back and then do, you do something and say, that's good enough. Maybe while you're still developing a solution, ask, send them a screenshot and be like, hey, is this something you could work with? And surprise, they give feedback. They actually would like to give you feedback, but if you didn't give them a chance until you pushed something or you already deployed something, and then they have to wait till the next time you have time to actually make changes again, they will become frustrated because you never gave them the chance of having a feedback cycle. And I know this is like, well, that would make my job much more harder, like sending them something, then getting feedback, working on it again, then doing something, then the management might not like it, then doing some changes again. And of course, this is like a back and forth and you will get angry, but in the end, you get something out of it. You get a positive reaction once you actually deployed it. And yeah. As I said, one day you might be happy that you did something positive for them because then they're more forgiving when you did something that might wasn't that great. And the last thing that you can have from it, and that is actually one thing I've learned recently, is if you explain to users why you couldn't do something that they ask you to, it's very helpful to explain to them why. It's not like, don't explain that the library can do it, that, that the database isn't made for that or something like that, but give them like a simple, but also not a stupefied answer to the reason why you couldn't do that. Just because it's not a great answer, because people will feel like, oh, he doesn't care or she doesn't care. So actually give them an answer and they will be like, oh, well, maybe in the future we can do that. And let's be honest, with ever-changing technology, if we might can do it in the future, it's a great answer. So, back to the clickbait thingy. Three things to remember well, for better usability. Woohoo! So, it's just three things that I try. It's this thing in university with my students. They learn so much in such a short amount of time, and especially when you learn programming languages and how to create cool and stylish websites. Usability sometimes isn't like the most amazing thing and most like flashy thing to learn. So I really boil it down to three things that will help them get better with usability. And it's my personal triforce for this theme. It's the one thing that I hope everybody gets and then takes home with them after these classes. The first one is, who's your target group? What 
do they want? Who are you developing for? What do they like? What do they don't like? What do they desire? What do they need? Is it an elderly woman who tries to find the, the phone number of a restaurant? Is it a young mobile native who tries to do a complexing shipping uh, wizard or like process? These people have different needs. These people have different capabilities. And if you have a broad audience, maybe take the person who is at least capable of doing things. And if you have a small audience, pick the people who are much, who have the most birth with all of the things that you do. Just, this is not a thing where you sit down and be like three hours targeting group, like a marketing team where you create personas. But just think of, who is this person who will sit behind a computer and will have to deal with the things that I now create? Next thing is goals. What are the goals of the person who used that? What, what do the want people who are standing behind the system want from that? Is it people need to be quicker in doing processes? People need to make less errors? Is it both of it? Okay, let's improve the validation. Maybe there is something that has a long loading time. Let's improve that. But consider what the overall goal is. Because people can communicate to you, oh, it has a too long loading time. This is not the answer you will get when questioning what the goal is. A marketing person, a customer care person. This is not the thing that they will tell you. People will tell you it needs to be faster. People will tell you, oh, we made so much errors, that's your fault. So... Get out there and ask what the problem is. Okay, you made more errors. Okay, good. Where can we improve that? Have a dialogue with them. How can we, how can we, make, how can we make this better? Not how I can make this better. Because I don't, I don't have a clue what your processes are. Of course, I know the business logic. So I know what the, like, the behind the scenes thing is that works. But I don't know what you're talking to the customer while you're doing this. Do you do that while you talk to the customer? Do you get an email? Do you get a letter? Do you have to scan something? Yes, we're still in an age where things arrive per fax. A lot lately, I've discovered. That's crazy. For us, as people who live behind their desktops, behind their laptops. But the reality sometimes is a bit different than we imagine. So... Think about the goals. And the third thing, and it has to do with the both of these things, is the conventions the user already knows. What things are so globally known that we can expect that certain target groups already know it? In web design, the most simplest thing is, what does a logo on, on the page do when you click on it? And Probably when I ask for the rows, most of you would say, I come back to the home page. And that's a convention. We know this. We don't need to think about this. S studies show that we don't even need to look for... Studies show that we don't even need... And people sometimes don't even look for a home button. So it's just about the, just about the logo. And that's with other things too. When you click on something where you have to enter the date, people by now on mobile are used that they have get a calendar of some sort so they can just click it. And if they don't get a calendar, please accept more than one way to enter a date because different nationalities, different locations, different kinds of people will enter it differently. So please make sure that you know who your user is what he will enter, and how to do these things. So, these are these three things that I think, if you remember only these three things, when you create your next user interface, will help you immensely. You will have people who will, might call you or write you a mail and be like, this was a nice, interesting experience. People are not not interested 
and how computer systems are built. For them, it's magic, for all they know. It's some Game of Thrones shit. It's something appears out of a ritual where people drink too much Coke, coffee, and pizza, and then the laptop created a new program. So we can talk to them about it, just as a salesperson would never have a fear that we don't understand what he's doing. I'm selling stuff. We are creating stuff. We are creatives, not with traditional art supplies, but with code. We do cool stuff. And I think we have to remember that at some time, sometimes, because otherwise we get desperate with our users. If the only feedback we get is meh, or no feedback at all, because they have the feeling that they don't even have a saying in what they get, then what, what else can we expect and get no answer to the things that we do for a living? So, but how can we get more into the mindset of a user? I call it the adventures of Captain Obvious, and I do it a lot with my students. It's when you look at a web page and ask a room full of students, what do you see? And most people are like, it's a website, of course, yeah. But what else do you see? And then we go around and be like, okay, there's a logo, there's a menu, there are articles, there are offers, there is something to log in, there's something to sign up. All of these things are placed, and especially when you go to websites, e-commerce websites, big e-commerce websites, these things aren't just placed because somebody thought it would fit there. These things are placed strategically, not only to help sales, but also to help marketing, and also to help the user. Because in the end, the flashiest marketing will not help a user through the, through the sign-up process and through the checkout process. So it has to be a marriage between sales, marketing, and the user interface. So please go into your own systems and play Captain Obvious for 10 minutes and be like, oh yeah, there is our menu. Okay, what's in the side menus? What is in the sub menu? Oh, look, there's a side by, it has also a menu. Oh, look, there are tabs, there are tables, there are cards. There are so many different interface elements. Look at them and then question them and then question why they have been there in the first place. Why did we put them there? Because it was something we did historically. It is a project that actually died by now. It is something we no longer use. It's something nobody no longer uses, something only a specific group uses. Maybe we have to shift something. Maybe we have to change some things to improve the interaction for the overall user target groups. Second. Sorry. <clears throat> what do you think your, ca your users are capable of? And I tell you that, I think most of you on the master underestimate your users. A lot of users would rather have a complex process for something very tedious, they have to do very often, but they know this process so well that they can do it in, a sleep, in their sleeps, rather than have a new process that they have to learn. So, sometimes very, very complex systems have been created because technology didn't help them. And when you look at that, all the things they have to remember out of their head because the system sometimes doesn't help them, you feel like, oh my God, they have to remember so much. They have to know where to click. Sometimes they even already know what to do when a certain error pops up and then know that they have to log out, log in, and nobody complains about it because it's just part of the system. And if it isn't so heavy that they start complaining about it, they will just live with that because why not? And the third thing is, please talk to your users. And there's a 
bit side thing. Please talk to the actual user, not their bosses. I know it's like hard every now and then when you have like hierarchies and they don't let you talk to a service engine or to an actual sales guy or girl. It's just, the problem is bosses usually have very different sets of tasks that they need to do other than their, that, than their subordinates. So what for them might be like a tedious task that needs to be done like once a month is a tedious task other users or subordinates of them have to do multiple times a week or multiple times a day even. So the best thing to do there is to request a screening session or an observance uh, thing where you just sit behind a user and look at what he's actually doing and have him explain it to you. It will help you with two things. First, it will help you with seeing what the user is actually doing with your system, because that's something sometimes very interesting, how people use it. Well, you intended to have them use it a very different way. And the other thing is, you will listen to their language, and you will hear what they are saying. And that can be very helpful when communicating with that. That again can create something where you're a bit in battle with the management because then you see like errors that need to be fixed in order for the user to have a better experience, but the management has like problems with that and or not. And then it's like, okay, what priority has it or not? So I get why some people think it will end up in this situation, but Again, I think it's worth it if you care enough about your users. So thank you for your time and please think about your users. Thank you very much, Hans. <laughs> it was a really calming talk. I really liked it and enjoyed it. Uh, well, uh, we have some questions here, yeah, uh, so I think we will spend the time wisely. Uh, so, uh, could you remember a small UI change which had a big positive or negative impact on the users? Yes. Um. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, we, we changed address entry um, from uh, an open entry where you just can type in uh, a street name, a, a postal address, and all these things into something that is based on a database from the Austrian uh, postal uh, office. And that would mean you first have to enter it in clear text, and then you get like a selection of different um, options, how this could have been interpreted. And at first, it was just a pain in the ass, and people were like really, really annoyed by it because first you have to do you had to do the same thing you had to do before, but then you had an extra step, and sometimes the address you wanted to enter didn't even appear. So that took a lot of like redoing it and rerunning it uh, till till we made it right, and people were no longer annoyed by it. Um, and the other thing, like the positive thing I remember is. Um, when I got to my last job, which was being part of the A1 Telecom Austria mass market IT development team, we had <laughs> we had uh, people. Uh, the, the people are still there, are laughing because it's, the name is so long. Um, so, what the thing is, when I first came there, everything was based on pop-ups. So you would click on something, and then it would pop up and then you would do their change, and then you would click OK, and then something. You might have to reload like the, the parent window who the pop-up created was from, and stuff like that. And I created a new streamlined, like one page layout for all of that, and people were really happy about not having to work with pop-ups anymore. So yeah, that was, that was a big change actually, so yeah. Yeah, hi. <laughs> can imagine. Uh, well, uh, now we can get to the other question. So I, I will rephrase. All users are conservative and resisting change, and no matter what, so they have their system that works, 
in case it works, yeah. So. Okay, good. So uh, again, I now work in a cultural institution um, with historic halls, um, with uh, lots of very interesting historically grown processes. Um, and I think that these people are so willing uh, to be helped by as long as you don't dumbify them. As long as you don't disqualify everything they did in the past. And as long as you don't go there and say, I know it better. And all developers to rationalize it just like this like to do that, which is not true. A lot of them do. Because we think we know better, but then again, we would need to read into these very, very complicated processes first to actually disqualify them. So instead of saying that all these people don't want to get helped, at the end of the day, people want to get their job done quicker, better, more efficient, and with as much help from the computer as you can give them. And I don't think that people will say no if you would say, I can cut out five minutes out of a task that usually takes you half an hour, and you need to do five times a day. So that's my answer to that. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, when creating an interface for users of varying skills and design it, um, with the weakest users in mind, wouldn't that hinder power users? What's your idea to solve that? Yeah. So when the group is so diverse, yeah, you yeah. don't have any target group. Yeah. I think you can add features like shortcuts. Is like one like very simple thing. Um, also, just ask these people what they would like, or observe them in what way they are power users. Um, I remember one team leader from my old work who opened the CRM system in five windows when they started in the morning and would work on five clients parallel or like on one client in two windows because she was just hindered by the loading speed. Um, these power users will probably find their way around, but... Also, she once asked me if I could give her, like, I don't know, she, she, I, she wanted, I think at one point it wasn't able to start, like, two processes at the same time. And I enabled her that. But I enabled it for every user. But I wasn't in fear that other users would use it that way because other users don't have that many tabs or windows open. So I wouldn't give hidden features or to a specific user group. Because at, maybe at one point somebody would see that and be like, oh, why can't I do that? Maybe build in power features or like features that you don't declarate as such that certain people know about and other people can learn about. Or maybe even send out a mail that this is a new feature. So people who want to use it can use it and people who don't, don't. But don't give them special abilities because this will create um, like not so nice interactions, I guess. <laughs> Too many paths yeah, that you can go through for the same solution. Uh, do you know some automated techniques to measure the usability? Um, I mean, you can do usability testing. Um, with Selenium, uh, if you do a web application, and there are probably other things too, where you can just test if how long things, uh, if things are actually working. I think usability a lot is about not hiding things, things being very quickly visible. And I also think it's about making the base system just work, having no errors appear when certain things are entered or um, so. An automatization of usability is pretty hard because a computer is not a user. Um, so I guess making sure that the system is using as you intended it to be used would already be a, a big step in the right direction. Uh, 
Uh, and how about uh, so when nobody complains about some behavior, do you have any tips and tricks how to push the users to uh, help you with that? It would be an interesting thing to, when you meet a user, maybe even like not in a work environment or like somebody who's like, oh, I'm used to the system. And you're like, oh, how do you like it? And let me tell you, if they don't like something about it, either they go with, yeah, it's okay. Uh, or they actually, or if they're actually already pissed at the system, they will tell you. So um, I think the best solution would be if they just go, meh, it's okay, to say, oh, did you have any problems with it lately? Is this something do you think we can improve? I mean, we have a busy schedule just like you, but maybe it's something we can fix easily with another task. And I guarantee you, even if these people don't give you an answer right away, if you give them your email address and be like, hey, think about it and send me an email, they will do that. Because everybody can think of at least some improvement when they think of the systems they work with daily. Yeah. Uh, okay, so maybe last question. Uh, so sometimes you have these product owners or users that tell you, ah, I want to have uh, this and this process in it. They don't describe the problem that they are having, they are suggesting a solution. How to deal with these people? Stakeholders, we can yeah. call them. Yeah, I mean, the problem with these kinds of requests is they usually happen in a, in, a, in a meeting room. It's like when people come up to you and be like, oh, let's make a meeting because I have this great idea, and then come into the meeting and they try to explain to you what their daily job is. And just as they don't understand what our daily job is, we don't understand what their daily job is. So there's already like a problem with, um, with language. So my suggestion would be not doing it in a meeting room if possible, but go to their desk and let it show it to you. Let them show you what they want. Actually, and some people would even like already suggest placements, like could we have a button there that does that and that and that? And then you can work from that and be like, oh, here's a piece of paper. Draw the thing you would like. It's called a paper prototype. It's that simple. And it's already some sort of visualization of what their dream system would look like. And it's e as easy as a sketch on paper. And if you don't understand what this person sketched, tell them. Let it explain to you again and again, and maybe even again. Because if you, go out, if you, if you get a sketch you don't know what to do with and get out of there, and then say, oh, it's pushed, you have it now, the thing that you thought you wanted. And then they say like, oh, that's not the thing I sketched, or at least the thing that I, not the thing that I thought that I sketched. That's a problem again. And if the answer you get is too, too unsure, or you have the feeling that the person isn't really sure what he actually wants, because that happens. Um, send them steps of your creation of the user interface you planned for him. Because while you're still planning it, you still can fix things. You still can change things. And maybe, and I know I'm talking to the really, really wrong people here in this room, maybe start with the user interface and program the business logic afterwards, especially in these cases. And I know a lot of people don't like this uh, opinion, but this would sometimes help, especially with a user interface. Thank you very much. Thank Give you. it a loud applause to Hans.